Good morning. morning. It's good to see each of you as we gather this morning to worship the Lord our God. My name is Nathan Wheeler. I'm the interim pastor here at Ormond Beach Presbyterian Church, and I welcome you and our guest as well this morning, and also to welcome you that uh, are joining us with us either in the live stream or at some time during this coming week. Uh, We welcome you with us as well. In the announcements, there are many in there. I'm going to begin, though, with Miss uh, Linda Bonick. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. Good morning. Good, morning. Good morning. My husband and I are hosting a big celebration for all the kids and the youth in church on this Saturday, the 4th of June, from 5.30 to 9. We have a pool party, lots of food. If you haven't already told Sandy Johnson you're coming, if you would let her know or call me just so we have a number, we hope that you all will come and join us. Thank you. In the uh, announcements, uh, I do want to to lift up and welcome uh, new members to Ormond Beach Presbyterian Church. I'd like to uh, introduce to you and welcome Barbara Cole. Barbara, are you present with us? If not, that's all right. We're going to introduce you. She's coming by a letter of transfer from First Parish Church in Dover, New Hampshire. And so we welcome uh, Miss Barbara Cole to us. Uh, Judith Larrabee. She might not be with us either, but she is joining by a profession of faith. Uh, Tom and Robbie uh, Zarsky. I see him right here. Tom will be a transfer of letter from the Unitarian Universal Church and Robbie by reaffirmation of faith. We welcome uh, each of these new members and uh, Please find a time to to catch up with them and get to know them, introduce yourself to them, and and help them along as they continue to uh, come into the life of the congregation. Beginning next Sunday, June 5th through the 28th, is the Summer Singers of 2022. (laughs) This is an opportunity of, of, if you would like to uh, join with the choir and just experiment with being a part of the choir, that that is open to you. you can read the announcement there as to how this works uh, with uh, no, no uh, through the summer here, no Thursday nights, but uh, Sunday morning practices and that kind of thing. So, uh, and no robes and casual attire. Sounds like a wonderful thing, doesn't it? <laughs> our, hymn, uh, min- our home ministry continues to need volunteers, and so I hope that you will take a look over that information and call the persons that are listed there if you have any kinds of questions. I'd like to bring an update to you on Marvin Barrows, Barrows, I'm sorry, Barrows, um, that uh, Marvin you know, had a, a car accident uh, several months ago there, and he's been kind of battling through some things. He's had some minor strokes as well, and, uh, uh, but his condition seems to be uh, continuing in an improvement. Uh, the strokes were not very de- debilitating, but they did strike uh, uh, his tongue, and so it's a little bit difficult for him to form words and hard to make sense of some of his language, but, uh, but his mind is still working pretty well. He can, he can hear and, uh, and uh, keep up uh, with the, the conversation a bit. So to keep Marvin in your prayers, he has just transferred to Solaris uh, Healthcare. Uh, from Advent Health, so he's in Solaris right now in Daytona Beach. So keep Marvin in your prayers as he continues to heal and to heal completely and wholly from uh, the both the accident and also the uh, the strokes. Uh, the there is the uh, estate planning seminar that is coming up June the 25th. If you would take and or if you haven't taken the opportunity to. To sign up that you are uh, intending to attend, uh, there is another opportunity there uh, for that. Uh, the summer music camp will be um, happening June the 20th to the 24th at 9 to 12. You can also see in the bulletin that there is uh, some items that are needed for that for this year's camp. So uh, get, you can catch up with Barbara or with Norris and uh, find out things uh, there on how you can help out. 
If you walk into a restaurant during uh, this weekend or even into tomorrow, you may find a table, a table that is sitting there with an empty chair, a table that is decorated, a table that is known either as the missing man's table or the fallen soldier's table. Uh, it is a table of honor and its items and the way in which it is laid out have significant um, uh, understandings to them. I'd like to invite you to know that if you do see such a table, that it is a time to have remembrance, remembrance of those that have fallen in the line of duty and service to our country, but also those that are missing, missing in action, those that have been lost in action and are not accounted for. That table also represents those families that have those particular uh, concerns and needs. And the items on that table all are significant about the life of the one that is missing and, and uh, about the family and their desire to either locate an MIA or one that uh, has been uh, unaccounted for or one that has fallen in the line of duty. So may your memorial weekend be one of not only joy and celebration, but one of remembrance and thanksgiving to the lives and the families that have uh, given uh, themselves so that you and I might have the freedoms as well as them too, the freedoms that we have in this land. So at that, let us continue to worship the Lord our God. Yes, Mike. Oh, he's at Advent still. 1217 in Advent. Okay. Thank you, Mike, for that update. Then let us continue to worship the Lord our God. serve on the session as chair of the evangelism committee for three more days. Uh, I just, it's been, I've served for six years and it's been an honor to serve you all and to serve the Lord. Um, it's been challenging, it's been wonderful, and my faith has grown and I know that I know who is in charge. The Lord is in charge. So listen to the words of one of my favorite Psalms, Psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Praise him, all you people of the earth, for he loves us with unfailing love. The Lord's faithfulness endures forever. Praise the Lord. Will you please join me in the call to worship? Before and after, first and last, Alpha and Omega, the steadfast love of God endures forever. Alleluia.
please join me in the call to confession. Having defeated sin and conquered death, the risen Christ beckons to us, welcoming our confession and promising new life. Trusting in the promise of the gospel, let us confess our sins, first silently and then together. Let us pray. Holy God, you have shown yourself to us in Jesus, perfect in every way, compassionate and kind, faithful and loving, gracious and hospitable. We stumble and fall as we seek to follow him, struggling to make his ways our ways. Our sins are real. Neither sin, nor doubt, nor death, nor anything else in all of creation can separate us from the love of God that is found in Jesus Christ. This is good news. Our first lesson comes from Psalm 97, 1 to 7. Hear now the Lord's word. The Lord is king. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness are all around the Lord. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before the Lord and consumes his adversaries on every side. His lightnings light up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness, and all the people behold his glory. All worshipers of images are put to shame. Those who make their boast in worthless idols, all gods bow down before the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. gospel reading comes from the gospel according to John, reading from the 17th chapter, beginning in verse 20. In honor of God's word, I would ask that all that are able to please stand. Listen now to the word of God. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one, as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am and to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these 
know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known so that the love with which you have loved me they may be in them, and I in them. This is the word of God. God, we thank you for your word, the story of your grace. You may be seated. In the church's calendar today, today is called the seventh Sunday of Easter. Yay! Actually, it's not a particularly familiar holy day, but it is the seventh Sunday that is after the resurrection. It is a day that simply comes between the times comes between the time of the ascension of our Lord, which was celebrated on Thursday, and Pentecost, which we will celebrate next Sunday, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the birth of the church. In other words, today is one of those between the time Sundays, falls between Jesus leaving his followers by ascending into heaven and the coming of of the Holy Spirit that had been promised for such a long time. Rather than rendering this day insignificant, I think it is those facts that make this day stand out in its significance. Today is a between the times Sunday and we are a between the times people. By that I mean think of the times that we live in the time of Advent where the announcement of the angels say peace on earth and goodwill to all and the actual experiencing of that shalom, that peace, that wholeness of being that comes only through our Lord, that shalom of God that we long to wait for and to enter into. We live in the between times within our prayer your kingdom come and actually realizing your will be done in heaven as it is on earth. Today's lectionary gospel readings underscores our between the time status. Chapter 17 of John's gospel, our Lord Jesus offered the beautiful and powerful prayer for the unity of followers. In verse 21, the master got to the heart of the issue when he prayed that all who follow him may be as one, as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Notice that demonstrating the oneness of the Followers of Christ is to be the way in which we are showing the world that Jesus came from God and that Jesus is indeed Lord. Obviously, the church of Jesus Christ has fallen significantly short of realizing Jesus' unity prayer. When we drive the streets of any community, we can see how differences of race, national origin, history, creeds, politics, personal opinion, styles of worship, have splintered Christ's universal church. Yet what happens in the church simply reflects what is going on in a wider society. In 1776, when we were just a young nation getting our act together, we began to look for a, 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 a motto and a creed that would bind us together as a nation. A committee recommended that we have what we now know today as the great seal of the United States. It is a bald eagle with a fluttering yellow ribbon in its beak. And on that ribbon is a motto in capital letters, E Pluribus Unum. Do you know what that means? Out of many, 
one, out of many, one. Originally, that motto was intended to express how the 13 distinct colonies were coming together to form a nation. Over the years, we have started to broaden that understanding to include how we are one nation that has been formed by people who have come from many places, who are of many races, who speak many languages, who practice many religions. We are e pluribus unum, out of many, we are one. In the not too distant future, actually in the year 2026, we will celebrate our 250th anniversary of adopting that motto. It seems a good time to continue to assess how are we doing being faithful to that national motto. At the very least, I think we can agree that we have significant room for improvement. Some social commentators are even saying our national differences are about as entrenched and <clears throat> vitriolic as they were during the Civil War. In fact, when a political map of the United States is portraying its red states and its blue states with very few differences from the map of, of, of its political divide in 1860, Jesus prayed that we would be one, that we are divided, we are a divided church, because we are a divided nation, because we live in a divided world. And there seems to be no paucity of willingness to work towards unity, not in the church or in the nation or in the world. A friend of mine once told about how his family gathered and they were having their annual family picnic gathering and this motto, e pluribus unum, it became trash, <laughs> thoroughly trash, by one of the members of the, of the family, one of the cousins. They began to talk about how our nation is increasingly diverse and the wonder of that diversity. But the cousin said, frankly, I'm not interested in that diversity. I want to associate with people who look like me, people who think like me, people who believe like me. And the obvious question would be asked, uh, the cousin was, of course, one that had many broken relationships, many troubled relationships. He had a former, he had a, an idea where friends that were made would become former friends as soon as he would discover something about them, about a differing of political opinion, of religious view, a disagreement about some social issue uh, where there was no uh, standard that was met in personal finances or raising children or even how you take care of the lawn, any of those things would break. <laughs> that relationship. The cousin didn't even do that well with his family. He had many marriages estranged from his grown-up children. Not so, so, so surprising. There is a high price for limiting associations to those who look like you and think like you and believe like you and agree with you on every topic and every way. There are very few people in the world that can meet that standard. Did you know that? In fact, I would say there is no one that can meet the standard that you might have. <clears throat> Deep into his poem, The Star Splitter by Robert Frost, he put it this way. If one by one we counted people out for the least sin, it wouldn't take long to get so we had no one left to live with. For to be social is to be forgiving. Each of us is unique. Each of us has a special gifting and calling. 
There's an, uh, that is just simply the underlying reality of God's creation, of who we are and how he has brought us together. There is no one else in the world that is just like you or like me. The billions of genes of DNA, even in identical twins, don't even match up to everything. For identical twins will tell you that they are different. They are different. And they'll show you the ways that they're different. We have to learn to live lovingly in a human community with our differences because it is not possible to live with people who are just like us. As Robert Frost put it, to be social is to be forgiving. The rub, of course, is that coming to terms with our differences and living in unity does not come naturally. It is hard work. Just getting along with folks who are almost like us, takes an enormous amount of effort. Even the thought of living in unity with those significantly different from us is overwhelming. It might even be argued that there is good reason to resist welcoming the differences. Our ancestors learned it was dangerous to trust those outside of your own family. They knew that from long experiences that the family who lived on the other side of the mountain often did not have the same interest as you at heart. For hundreds of years, ideas about how to bridge that gap, to live in unity, to live in peace and harmony did not seem practical. In fact, collective human experience tends to confirm the views of that cousin at the family reunion picnic table. Because it is easiest, it must be best to associate only with people who look like us and think like us. We might even claim it is human nature to want to exclude those who differ so that they can, so that we can be associated only with those that are most like us. My mom and I used to sit down and watch old classic movies together. One that I remember that I loved was The African Queens, a 1952 classic. The film takes place in Central Africa during the First World War. It stars, there you go, Humphrey Bogart as Charlie Ulnut, a gin-swilling riverboat captain. And who else? Catherine Hepburn as Rose Sayer, a very straight-laced missionary. One night as they're floating down a crocodile-infested uh, African river, Charlie just gets rip-roaring drunk, and Rosie is aghast by his behavior and angrily scolds him. Charlie tries to do what any of us do, justify his behavior by claiming that getting drunk every once in a while is only human nature. To which Rose straightens her shoulders and says, human nature, Mr. Olna, is what we are put on this earth to rise above. There's great truth in that observation. Wanting to associate only with people who are much like us as human possibly, making that the, the natural thing as people of faith, as people of followers of Christ, we are to live to a higher standard than doing that that just comes naturally. We are called to be instruments of God in building a world where the children of the creator of the universe lives they might live in unity of peace, harmony, justice. That requires rising above human nature. And while it is a challenging task, it is possible to go against what comes naturally. Paul put it this way in the book of Revelation. No, book of Romans. <laughs> Started with an R. 
he said these words, do not be conformed to this world. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. The New Living Translation, which makes an effort to translate the meaning of the text, the original text, to the thought in English for us, rather than being a word-for-word -word translation, puts it beautifully this way. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. It is perhaps with a tinge of lighthearted humor that a religion writer by the name of Paul Prather suggests that there is a scientific basis for understanding the biblical admonition to be transformed by changing the way that we think. Prather cites the science of neuroplasticity, also called brain plasticity or brain malleability. He writes this, as close as I am able to understand the science, as human beings, we are born with brains already downloaded with certain software. By that I mean, we come programmed with certain tendencies, predispositions, personality traits. For instance, we think it is human nature to want to associate with people we consider just like us because our brain came programmed for that conclusion. Fortunately, we are not doomed to live out our lives with the software with which we come. The computer that sits on top of our shoulders is always getting updates and fixes to glitches based on different needs and new experiences. To take that out of the language of computers and to put it into the language of psychology, we have the capacity to learn, to mature, to change. To put it into the theological language of Romans chapter 12, verse 2, you do not have to copy the behavior and the customs of the world, for God can transform you into a new person by the renewing of your mind. That means God can make you into a new person by changing the way that you think, by the way you believe, by the way that you behave. To be perfectly honest, he continues, I do not know enough about the science of neuroplasticity or brain malleability to offer an informed opinion. I do know from experience and observation, however, that people can rise above what comes naturally to do what is right in the eyes of God. Hmm. To do what is right in the eyes of God. Because it is first God that desires to come into our lives and to move us towards new possibilities, new thinking, new reality. Consider the story of Nelson Mandela first president of the United South Africa. Mr. Mandela was born in a tiny village of cows and corn and mud, a region where black Africans were forced to live apart from the white Africans. As a young man, he gravitated quite naturally towards violent groups that challenged the laws. The, South, the white South African judicial system sentenced him to a life of prison and for many of his nearly three decades in prison, he labored under the hot African sun using a hammer to change big rocks into little rocks. Indignity upon indignity was heaped upon him, including being denied the permission to attend the funerals of his mother and also of his elder son. When Mr. Mandela was released from prison, he had reason to be angry, to be bitter about the way the white South Africans had treated him. He had reason to say the time of white dominance was over and that now it was the time of black dominance. But that did not happen. 
Instead of leading a bloody race war by calling for revenge for the past injustices, Nelson Mandela called for compromise, forgiveness, compassion, and reconciliation in a nation where all races would be represented. How does that happen? submit to you that it is just one of the mysteries of God's grace. It is a fulfillment of the promise that a person can be transformed by the renewing of the mind. For those of us who live between the times, it is an incomplete glimpse into how the world will look when the will of God is done on earth, just as it is done in heaven. And all of God's people said,
for those who are able, let us stand to confess the faith of our baptism as we use the Apostles' Creed, saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From then he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> Let us come before the Lord in prayer. Gracious and sovereign Lord, you are Lord of the nations. On this Memorial Day weekend, we pause to reflect upon our blessings as a nation, and the high cost of those blessings for many. Thank you for the freedom that we enjoy in this country, for the opportunities to flourish and the security of our land. And thank you to those who have served in the armed services of our country, risking their lives for our liberty. Thank you to those who have given their lives in service to our country, sacrificing in such a costly way, all for the sake of others, which includes us this day. And thank you for a day that can be set apart not just for celebration, but also for a solemn remembrance as we consider the sacrifices given by so many, both in military service and also those in civilian service. Lord, may we be more aware of just how blessed we are as a nation May we be more grateful of our blessings, more faithful in stewarding them well, more eager to share them with others. We pray for today for families and friends of those who have given their lives in the service of our nation. May they be comforted in their sadness. May they be reassured that the sacrifice of their loved one contributes to a worthy cause. May they be proud of those they have lost in trusting their ultimate fate into your gracious hands. Give wisdom to the leaders of our armed services that they might know how best to deploy the troops for the causes of freedom. May their efforts be successful so that true peace with justice might be established not only in our nation but throughout the world. For you so love the world that you gave the only begotten Son. Guide those then who lead our nation in the international affairs. Help them to pursue diplomatic paths that prevent needless conflicts. Lord, may they have your wisdom about them and how to use the military might that is entrusted to them, to us. And God of peace, stir in the hearts of leaders of all nations and in all who would use violence to further their cause. Change their hearts, change their minds. Give them a passion for shalom, peace, wholeness. Bring an end to the pain and suffering and injustice and violence in our world. We know, dear Lord, that ultimate peace will not come until your, your kingdom is here in all of its fullness. Nevertheless, we pray for a foretaste of that future glory 
We ask for the growth of peace throughout our world today so that fewer and fewer men and women will have to risk and even to sacrifice their lives. We long for the day, as Isaiah wrote, when people will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. May your kingdom come, Lord, and your will be done as it is in heaven. All praise be unto you, God of grace, God of mercy, God of justice, God of peace, your peace, your shalom, your wholeness. May that descend this day as it has throughout this past week of prayer, as it will move into its future of prayer upon the families and the city of Uvalde, Texas. Oh Lord, this day we would lift up parents who have lost children. And as they move through this nightmare, may your grace embrace them. We would pray for the families of the two teachers who were going about just their normal day's routine, who lost their lives. who even shielded with their bodies the children. We pray for, this, for, the, for the school children and the others that are grieving. For at a time when they should have been looking forward to a summer break, they now have this tragedy and this grieving. And they're trying to make sense of it, Lord. May your peace your shalom, your wholeness, comfort them. We would pray, God, that you would bring a sustaining knowledge into those first responders as they had to move into that scene, that they might be able to cope with what they saw, what they heard. Pray for Uvalde as a whole, as a community, as it comes together to support each other in the days that lie ahead. And Lord, most of us didn't even know Uvalde existed until this day. May we never forget them and the needs of that community as we continue to lift them in prayer. And there are many others that we would lift before you this day, Lord. They are on our hearts and on our minds. We would lift up Jim's mother, Janice, who is in the hospital awaiting a surgery. May your grace and peace be with Janice as she faces that surgery this day. And yes, Lord, we continue to pray for the your, your, for, the, for Ukraine, for the war that is there, for the fallen soldiers of that war. May they know your peace. May the families know your peace. language becomes insignificant inside of the pain, but you, Holy Spirit, you know exactly what is going on, and you know where to focus prayers and power and, and support and love and kindness. So reach out with our prayers to bring to them your shalom and your peace. Jesus, bring to our remembrance afresh this day the prayer that you continue to teach us afresh to pray 
say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now let us offer ourselves. Astounding God, we live this day as witnesses to Christ's ascension from this earthly realm and to the heavenly kingdom. We stand in awe and wonder at what we hear and see. Open the eyes of our hearts to comprehend the power and truth of your words. Give us courage. and giving God, you are the one who first has given to us all that we need for life. May our faith be nurtured as your people. In the name of Christ. 
to the world where God's peace, God's shalom, God's wholeness is alive in you and may it overflow to those around you. Be a people who have the eyes to see, the ears to hear, and the feet already prepared with the good news of the gospel of Christ. Go out from this place then and as you greet people and as you find yourself in every situation of life, May you know that God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit abides with you. And his promise is to be with you every day of your life. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. 